Think about the growth aspect of your business before you think about the profit aspect of your business. Think about the engine of growth before you think about harvesting profits. Coffee's for closers only. So we've established my proposal is sound in principle. Now we're just haggling over price. <laughs> Let's see how much we're going for on eBay. I mean, it's the same as Dunkin' Donuts. Cost 15 times the price. Today's podcast is sponsored by Jennings Executive Search. I had a great conversation with John Jennings about the skills needed in different pricing roles. He and I think a lot alike. If you're looking for a new pricing role, or if you're trying to hire just the right pricing person, I strongly suggest you reach out to Jennings Executive Search. They specialize in placing pricing people. Say that three times fast. Welcome to Impact Pricing the podcast where we discuss pricing, value, and the possibly controversial relationship between them. I'm Mark Stiving. Today, our guest is Jeff Robinson, and here are three things you want to know about Jeff before we start. He is the author of a new book, Price for Growth, which I had a chance to skim this morning. Very interesting. Uh, He's been an executive of pros for 17 years. He certainly understands pricing. And in 2020, he went out on his own uh, with a new pricing firm called Revolution Pricing. Welcome, Jeff. Thanks, Mark. Hey, how did you get into this world of pricing? Um, great question. So uh, it goes back to uh, my, my first three times I took economics in college. I failed the first two times. Third time around, finally got it right. <clears throat> I ended up getting the highest grade in the class. And I looked around and I said, hey, maybe I can do something with this. And when I went out to get a job after I got my economics degree and nobody wanted to hire an undergrad economist. So I went to MBA school and went to work for a software company. And a few years later, somebody told me about this company called Pros. And what they did was they sold pricing optimization software, which used economic principles. And I thought, no way. Um, I got to check out this company. So I joined Pros and I thought, now I'm finally going to be able to use all these uh, great economics principles I learned. And then basically for the next 20 years, uh, I've just kind of been evolving from there. Nice. And, And so why did you stay? I mean, 17 years, 20 years is a long time at one company. Yeah. So it was, um, actually two different stints. I was one of the guys that call it boomerang. Uh, so I was there for 10 years. And when I got to pros the first time, my first task was to try to uh, help the company take their airline pricing software, revenue management software into other industries. And so um, I was really in charge of partnerships. So I started working with a company called Anderson Consulting, which later turned into Accenture. Um, we built a great partnership. We were ready to kick it off and run. And then 9-11 happened, SARS happened, and people started uh, uh, closing their checkbooks. And so we kind of just went off trying to sell pricing software. And the next thing I knew, we had a a few uh, big customers who wanted to pay us a lot of money to help them build uh, pricing solutions. And um, I was able to... uh, enjoy a lot of growth uh, during the first few years at Pros. Finally, in 2007, we went public. And um, I left the company a few years after that. I won't get into why, but um, I wanted to do something different. And so I went with a small company uh, called Advantis, was there for a couple of years, and then decided I wanted to go do something else and looked around, interviewed with everybody. And uh, Pros offered me a good job. So I went back and within a couple of years, I was head of product. And um, then after that, I was general manager of our transportation logistics industries. And um, then finally, I realized I needed to go do something on my own. So uh, that's kind of my story. Yeah, yeah. Well, the reason that you're on the podcast is you had commented on, on an article that I put up on LinkedIn on sales discount authority. And um, the article had talked about something Mark Hunter had once said to me, which was he doesn't think salespeople should have any sales discount authority. And I find that pretty challenging and interesting, but you replied and said, hey, it's brilliant. And not only that, it improves margin and it takes away the, or it improves the buyer experience. 
Do you have any evidence or do you want to talk about that a little bit so we can all understand your thinking? Yeah. So, I mean, I'll come at it from a couple of different perspectives. So first of all, if you just think about um, what happens when salespeople have negotiation authority. So when a salesperson has negotiation authority and you're the customer, all of a sudden you have a job, you know, before you could just buy something. Now you have to worry about whether you're getting the best price. So you go into it. It's kind of like when you go buy a car. Um, you know, for me, it's it's always been an anxious uh, proposition to go buy a new car because I know I'm going to have to like spend hours trying to negotiate the best price. And even when I'm done and I've knocked down the price by, I don't know, a few thousand dollars, I walk away wondering, did I really get the best price? So, you know, if you translate that, you think about just from a customer perspective, what does it take on their part when the sales rep has negotiation authority? And especially if you realize that there's really no objective um, discount driver behind it. It's just the discretion of the sales rep. I mean, it's just extremely frustrating. So there's, so, so there's that angle. So let me, let me uh, pile on with that for just a second. And I remember back in the 90s, uh, we had Saturn cars. And the big deal about Saturn was it was no haggle pricing. You walked in and you paid whatever the price was that was on the sticker. Uh, they weren't going to negotiate. And buyers seemed to love that. They said, wow, this is just the way I want to buy a car. Now, everybody didn't go that way, right? All the other car manufacturers didn't do that. But Saturn did. And they seemed to get a ton of press and, and goodwill from that. Yeah. And, you know, I think you could look at that as an example of, did it really pay off for Saturn? I don't know. You know, I don't know. I don't know. The jury's out. I think for some companies, uh, they're so entrenched in the business practice of negotiating. And even, especially when they've trained their customers that they, maybe they can't make the conversion back. Um, definitely there's examples like that all over the place uh, where a company's tried to change their uh, pricing model from a, a fixed pricing world to either a, a discretionary negotiating pricing world, or maybe even something where there's uh, they're running coupons or discounts or different ways to lower the prices. Yeah. Well, the other side of that, are we going to negotiate though, is we, I, I'm a strong believer in price segmentation and how do I charge different customers, different prices and if I truly trusted and believed my salespeople, they're the closest to the customer and could possibly dictate or create or calculate uh, my customer's willingness to pay, which then says giving them negotiation ability is really them getting closer to capturing willingness to pay. Yeah, so um, there's a lot of truth to that. And you know, if you look at my bio, I've spent a lot of years managing salespeople and actually selling myself, you know, like um, whenever I was a sales manager, of course I wanted, I wanted unlimited power to negotiate price. And a lot of times I got it and, you know, I don't, I'm not sure I'd made the best decisions for the company or not, but when you, when you think about it, um, are sales reps in a good position to understand the customer? Yeah. They're close to the customer. I think a, a lot of times they're in a, good position to understand the customer. But then again, you step back and you say, do sales reps, do you, do you want sales reps running your pricing strategy? And if, so think about this more, for you to be, to be very good at, at running a pricing strategy, you need a rapid feedback loop where you're, you're testing something in the market and you're kind of getting information back from the data as fast as you can. Well, if you put a sales rep in the middle of that, you don't know what conversations the sales rep's having. You don't know how hard they tried to negotiate a price. So you're kind of putting mush in the um, data feedback loop, right? So that's, that's one argument for why you don't want sales reps um, in the middle of a pricing strategy. And there are plenty of sales reps, I'm sure, they're master salespeople. They're probably the best people that could get the best price out of a customer. I'm not sure they're always incentivized to do that. Um, most sales reps that I've been involved with, they're pretty risk averse. And yep. so they're much more um, incentivized to just get the deal at all costs and move on, right? So what they're trying to do is they wanna get the revenue with the least amount of effort 
so they can move on to the next customer or move on to the next opportunity. So I guess to your point, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of truth to um, sales reps being close to the customer, being able to figure out willingness to pay. But the counter argument I would say is, do you really want them determining your pricing strategy or getting in the way of the data feedback in pricing in your pricing strategy? I have another point. Yeah. Um, well, before you, before you jump there, I just want to sure. pile on here. And I would say that, that I think it's theoretically true that salespeople could get closer to willingness to pay, but I actually don't think in practice that happens. I think in practice, they're trying to get the deal closed as possible, as fast as possible. They're using every lever they possibly can pull. And one of the levers is whatever discount authority we've given them. That's a lever they're going to use and it's easy to use and they're going to pull it. Oh, so, yeah. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm with you on that, but go ahead and make your other point. Well, if, yeah, pricing is an incredibly easy lever. And I guess the other point is, so we're talking about price differentiation. Um, I think price differentiation is not only fine, I think it's, it's desirable, but I think you got to do it in a way that you can maintain a good customer experience across your customer base, right? And so what happens is um, if you if you can differentiate pricing by differentiating the product or what you're selling in terms of the total value proposition, then you can do it in a way that's fair, that customers don't feel like they're, they're getting screwed. Um, if all you're trying to do is kind of put your finger up in the air and figure out uh, how much will Mark pay? Um, I think he'll pay more. So I'm going to charge him a little more. Well, customers hate that. Customers hate that um, they're getting priced based on their willingness to agree. I mean, and so if it's if it's not fair, you're going to get a lot of blowback. If it is fair, then, you know, they'll play along. I mean, look at the airline industry. You have tons of differentiated pricing, but I think most people understand the game. They understand there's some objectivity behind where the pricing is coming from. Yeah, I'm, fair is a really weird word that we could talk about for hours because I don't understand it very well. But uh, in my mind, when we do pricing, our job is to make our customers perceive it as fair. And, and so if we're doing something that they perceive as unfair, we've probably made a mistake. Yeah, totally agree. So. And when if you think about what does fairness really mean, it's not objective. <laughs> it, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's exactly what you said. Does a customer feel like they're being treated fair, fairly? Yep. Yeah. Well, hey, let's jump into a much bigger topic for a second. And let's talk about the role of pricing because uh, we brought a pricing strategy. And first off, let me just toss you the big softball. Uh, what do you think of the role of pricing in companies today? Um, I think it's evolving. I think it's evolving in the right direction, uh, but I think it's evolving too slowly. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. Here's a thing that really bothers me. When you think about everything that pricing touches, I mean, you can't have sales without, you can't have a sales strategy without a pricing strategy because every sale has a price attached to it, right? When you think about communicating value and communicating price, that's partly the job of the marketing department. Well, can you really have marketing and a marketing strategy without pricing? I don't think so. You know, you look at costs, you look at finances. Can you have a financial strategy without pricing? You can just go through um, and you see that pricing really is tied into all these different functional areas of a company and it really matters. And um, one of the things that I point out in my book is it's not just the per unit profit margin that really matters. It's how do you leverage price to be able to accomplish big strategic things like becoming the leader in your market, the fastest um, growing market share leader in your market. That's something that really matters, right? So with that, I'll say, I look at most companies and it's kind of tragic that pricing seems like it's been relegated to kind of a back office function uh, where they're in charge of margin, policing margin, making sure that you know sales reps don't run amok. Um, and I don't think margin police is the right role for pricing. I think pricing needs to be at the forefront. I think pricing should be um, integral with the entire growth strategy of the company. And I, the reason I say that is because I think they have the most data. 
and I think they have theoretically the capability to understand um, all these intersections, if that makes sense. Yeah, so in a lot of ways, I agree with that. And then in a lot of ways, I find it really challenging. Uh, one of the things that I often think about when I th when I teach pricing and work with companies about pricing, it's almost never about pricing. It's almost always about value. Uh, how do customers perceive value? How are we communicating value? Are we even building products and packaging products that have value in the way that customers want to make those choices? And, and so when I think about that value piece, that feels to me like it really needs to belong in in product management, in the product team, the people who are trying to figure out where are we going to go build next, because they're the ones who should know the value of the product to the marketplace. But what that really says to me is that those people should own and understand pricing well, where instead what we tend to do is put a pricing department out there that's managing spreadsheets and price lists and you know we're watching for variants or maybe managing an escalation path but it isn't the big strategic stuff of what should we build and how do customers get value yeah um yeah you're bringing up an incredibly uh, important point and i totally agree with it uh i've seen it uh for the last 20 years it's funny that uh, your experiences are very similar to mine. So when you think about, you go in and you talk to a company about pricing, uh, like you said, it's almost never really about pricing. Uh, they want to talk about something else. Now the question is, um, you know, who's the right person to determine uh, what the value of the product's going to be? Um, and who's, so yeah, it makes a lot of sense that pricing, that product people should own that. But at the same time, um, who should be informing the product people about what a different pricing strategy, what kind of impact a different pricing strategy is going to have on the impact of a company? So based on some value differentiation, um, it's just, you know, I would be satisfied if we got all the product people and renamed them pricing people and gave them the, the role, you know, to manage uh, across the entire uh scope of the company uh the full growth strategy of the company but i guess the point i'm trying to make is uh whether it's you know pricing or anybody else it should be a coordinated uh strategic effort rather than done in a silo and i think my big objection is that things get done in silos and like you said if you think about which silo the pricing uh, team generally finds himself in it's not the glamorous front end stuff that's really driving growth for the company. It's too many times an administrative um, set of tasks or they're the margin police or something like that. Yeah, I think you and I are completely in agreement on this. Now, one of the things that I find about most pricing people is that they don't understand the value of their products because you have so few pricing people and so many products and product managers out there that there's no way they could understand that. And yet, if you think about what you and I do and know, we actually understand pricing and pricing strategies and customers willingness to pay and how they perceive value. I think it would be phenomenal for pricing people inside a company to be like you and I. And their job then is as internal consultants. How do I help salespeople learn about value, sell value? How do I help uh, product people design products that have more value? How do I help marketing people figure out what are the most important value statements? And we're actually talking about value and not features. So that, so that feels to me like a really big deal in the role of pricing. Yeah, that, I mean, I think that's, that's kind of what I was trying to say. I, I do think that, I mean, take your example, you know, can pricing people really understand the value of all the products? Well, I mean, you look at some of the, I mean, we we did business with a company who was price, who had to price 300 new products per day. So tell me how a pricing team is gonna be able to get their arms around the value uh, of 300 new products per day. It's just too much, they can't do it, right? So what they really have to do is they need to bubble up to a higher level. And when you're thinking about value differentiation and you're selling 3 million products, well, 
it probably doesn't make sense to go through and do 300 million value studies. It probably makes more sense to bubble up and say, what is really the, what's the differential reasons why companies buy from us versus our competitors, right? It's not because of this one uh, out of 3 million products over here or this collection of 25 products. It's because maybe of a service feature or maybe, um, the, the selection we're able to offer or the availability or some of these higher level um, company level differentiators. Um, but again, your point is, I think, can pricing people make or add more value as an internal consultant? Yeah, definitely. Um, because as an internal consultant, they can operate at a level where they can add a lot of value and they don't have to go into every minute detail. Um, they can go into the level of detail that's that's needed, but still um, not only should they be consultants, but I think they should be driving the conversations. And that's, if, if you get to it, Mark, that's really what I, um, what I think pricing should be doing that I don't think they're doing enough of. I think it's more of a reactive role. I think it's seen as a support role and I think it should be more front and center and they should be driving the conversations about how should the company be strategizing their growth? What new customer segments should they be selling to? What um, avenues for revenue expansion should they be pursuing to existing customers? What should they be doing to help minimize customer churn? You know, those types of uh, conversations, I think they should be leading. Yeah, I think that's spot on. Now, if you were to put yourself in the shoes of, let's pick a title or a role, uh, let's call it a director of pricing. So they don't run everything, but they run a lot. What do you think they should do differently? How do they get out of this day-to-day -day managing the tactics and jump into the strategy side? Um, I'm glad you're asking that question because I think that's exactly the right question. And I think that's where it has to start. So whether you're a director of pricing, you're a pricing manager, you're a VP of pricing, I think, you know, what I would like to see is I would like to see if I were in that role, I'm starting to have strategic conversations with other um, functional executives that are not being had. You know, I would want to have a, a situation where we're looking at um, growth scenarios. So if we were able to change our growth rate, from 10% to 12%, what would that do for our ability to dominate this market? You know, let's have that conversation. Let's start having um, conversations at the executive level. I think when, when pricing is seen as uh, kind of the margin police role, then nobody really wants to talk about it. You know, it's, it's funny because uh, it seems like for years we've been trying to get on this, pricing's been trying to get on the CEO's radar, right? I mean, we have books, we have webinars, everything about how to get, how you can um, make pricing matter to the CEO, how you can get it on the radar. But most of those books talk about value and they talk about profit, but they're not talking about growth. They're not talking about the big strategic things that most CEOs really care about. Um, that's what I think... Um, I would like to see happen at the at the level of director of pricing. I'd like to see it. By the way, in my book, I I I say I think all pricing titles should be renamed to pricing and growth. Like the VP of pricing should be the VP of pricing and growth, or be the VP of growth. Because right now, when the sales guys see the VP of pricing, they think, oh, that's the that's the VP of um, of uh, killing business. That's the VP of losing customers. You know. Uh, guys they don't want to talk to, if that makes sense. Yeah. Oftentimes we're called the sales prevention team. Exactly. The, you yeah. know, they, <laughs> no one wants the VP of sales prevention. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so, so I think that makes a lot of sense. What you've essentially said is you think the strategic direction of pricing should be dictated as not only are we trying to capture margin, but we also need to capture growth. And you can think of growth as long-term margin, right? What are we What are we going to get in profit dollars over the long run? Yeah, yeah. I would I would say it maybe even slightly. See, I think sometimes pursuing margin is a great aspiration. And if you put it the way you put it, so if I'm looking at long-term, if I look at the value, the 
the value of a customer long term, and I think about all the profits they can generate for me, I think that's very important. If I'm thinking about next year's profits, I may make a decision that's going to ruin my ability to get long-term profits. If I if I do a price increase that makes a customer feel like they're not being treated fairly, I may lose 20 years of profits from that customer, right? So, so not only do I think it's margin plus growth, I think a lot of times, you know, it's margin versus growth. Uh, I like to think of um, pricing has two different kind of macro uh, goals. One is how do you acquire uh, customers and really think of it as like a profit generation engine, right? So you wanna make investments so you can acquire customers so you can generate profits in the future. You know, the other, the other role is think of it, I call it profit taking, right? And if you think about what does profit taking mean in the stock market? Profit taking in the stock market means we're going to sell. It means we're going to get out, right? We're going to take our, our money and run. Well, it's kind of like that in pricing. You know, you can take profits. You, you'll get customers who will pay high prices for a, a quarter or a year. But are you ruining your long-term uh, profit generation engine by doing that? I think you need to think about when's the right time uh, to grow profits or to take profits versus the right time to grow uh, that profit engine, that, that profit creation engine. And the reason I say that is you, if you step back and look at all the fastest growing companies over the last 20 years, you know, think about companies like Amazon, um, Google, uh, Netflix, uh, Domino's Pizza, Good Food, uh, Shopify, these are not companies that were employing margin expansion strategies. These are companies that were 100% employing growth strategies. They were worried 100% about building the engine to create profits more than the ability to extract profits out of their existing customers, right? So I think, and I'm not trying to swing the pendulum too far the other way, but I do think it's a, it's a major consideration that should be at the forefront of every pricing executive's mind. And I just, I haven't seen it over the last, I mean, I see it in, I don't know, one out of 20 companies. That means 95% of the companies I'm talking to, they seem just way too myop myopically focused on margins. Yeah. Anyway, that's it. I think that was brilliant. And uh, just to add on, you've heard the Jeff Bezos quotes uh, from Amazon. He says, your margin is my opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Jeff Bezos, uh, I mean, he's done a lot of things that were that were dead right on. Um, I have a quote. I have a, uh, one of his quotes in my book where he's talking about elasticity studies. And um, he said, yeah, we run elasticities all the time and they tell us we should raise our prices, but we don't want to do that because we want the customers to trust us. I mean, um, and he said that years and years ago and now look what's happened you know how many of us uh put our trust in amazon i mean today i'll confess i don't even look at other providers i go to amazon and if the price seems halfway reasonable click purchase you know uh it's it's because the experience that i've had over the years i don't feel like i'm getting screwed on amazon yep anyway i think that's just an example of the of what growth strategies should look like. Nice. And uh, as I skimmed through your book this morning, uh, I noticed that you articulated three, and I'm going to use my words for this, <laughs> you articulated three revenue buckets that companies need to worry about. And what I love about that is that's exactly what I wrote in my new book as well. Uh, so my new book is called Win, Keep, Grow. It's for subscriptions, but you're doing repeat business, which is essentially the same thing. Yeah. And uh, you have to win customers. You have to keep customers. You have to grow customers. Absolutely. And and so those those are, I love the fact that you put those in your book. Yeah. In fact, the funny thing is, right after I released my book, I saw your book come out and I'm like, that, those are the right words. Win, keep, grow. Um, right on. You know, you, you, but what is what does win keep grow what, what does that refer to that refers to building a growth engine right like nowhere in your book title does it say squeeze out another percentage margin out of 
any particular customer segment. I'm not saying it's not available for the taking for uh, many customers, many segments, but I think you're right on. That's where the focus should be. That's where the first focus should be. If you think about it, and I'm actually writing another book right now, Mark, um, it's going to be out in the next month or two. But one of the things that I point out in this new book that's coming out is um, growth should precede profits, right? It shouldn't be a lot of companies. They feel like um, profitable growth is one action that happens all at once. So, and I'll, I've got some quotes that, that you'll see, but I think uh, one of the quotes is you'll never go broke by, by charging a margin. Well, yeah, you won't go broke on a, a particular customer, but you may miss the opportunity to get a lot of customers if you, if you try to ch charge too high margins. But the whole idea is if you think about growth precedes profits, then from a pricing perspective, uh, pricing leadership should be thinking about growth first and then thinking about profits when the time's right. Yeah, I, I think that's spot on. I'm not sure that I've thought through it enough to say that I agree 100%, but I think that's that's really close in in uh, many, many cases that go through my mind. So, and, Jeff, and by the way, is, if we if we learn that we don't agree, it's it's easy. We just change our minds, you know? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, this has been fascinating. We're already over time, uh, but I'm still going to ask the final question. Uh, what's one piece of pricing advice you would give our listeners that you think could have a big impact on their business? Um, I think I've already given it. Uh, think about the growth aspect of your business before you think about the profit aspect of your business. Think about the engine of growth before you think about harvesting profits. That would be my one piece of advice. Excellent. Nothing like consistency. <laughs> well, hopefully, hopefully yeah, there's exactly. some consistency there. Jeff, thank you so much for your time today. If anybody wants to contact you, how can they do that? Uh, you can uh, hit me up on LinkedIn. Uh, I think you're going to provide the link, but uh, it's Jeff Robinson four. Uh, that's the subdirectory on LinkedIn. The other uh, hit me up via email, Jeff at revolutionpricing.com. Perfect. Thank you so much. And episode 141 is all done. Uh, thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this, would you please leave us a rating and a review wherever you download this podcast? Those are very valuable to us. And finally, if you have any questions or comments about the podcast or pricing in general, feel free to email me, mark at impactpricing.com. Now, go make an impact. Thanks again to Jennings Executive Search for sponsoring our podcast. If you're looking to hire someone in pricing, I suggest you contact someone who knows pricing people. Contact Jennings Executive Search.